have a Where did the money come from? That was the question. Where did the money come from? Oh, well, where is did there a money tree? Oh, yeah. Is it debt? Are we going to have to pay it back in the yeah. future? You know, so these are the questions. Let's do, let's do that. Where did the money come from? Because, um, you know, I think we have right now in the rear view mirror, just very, very clear examples of exactly how governments muster the firepower to commit to spending trillions and trillions of dollars when just months before everybody was talking about, you know, if we want to spend money, we have to find money. How will you pay for it? I mean, if you think back to, you know, 2019 and um, the presidential campaign and the Democratic primaries and, you know, we had a very crowded uh, slate of Democratic presidential hopefuls. You, you, Giannis, Naomi and I know well uh, some of the people who were vying for the vice president uh, for the presidential nomination on the democratic side and people had you know platforms that ranged in ambition from very very progressive um, big ticket things you know a 16 trillion dollar green new deal uh canceling all student loan debt i mean very ambitious all the way down you know the scale to the other end the the more moderate sort of things but every single candidate at every turn was dogged by the question how will you pay for it? Where will the money come from? And every candidate attempted to demonstrate where the revenue would come from, how the taxes would be increased to generate the revenue to allow for this spending to take place. Everything happened in this sort of a budgeting framework, right? The idea that you have to find the money and pay for your spending. And then COVID happened, right? And this is just months later, really. And it's March of 2020. And all of a sudden, without really a moment's hesitation, Congress begins spinning out multi-trillion dollar spending packages. And not just in the US, not just Congress, but around the world. Governments are committing huge sums of money. And so when we say, you know, how did they do it? Where did the money come from? Here's what happens. Congress writes a bill. And in our case in March, the biggest bill was known as the CARES Act. That was a $2.2 trillion piece of legislation. That legislation is Congress's way of ordering up, okay, $2.2 trillion from its bank, from the Federal Reserve. Congress did not go out hat in hand to China or to the investor class or to anyone else and raise up 2.2 trillion, they don't have to. Congress has the power of the purse. Congress can commit to spending money that they do not have, right? What they do is pass the bill. And if the votes are there, the money follows. In a, in a very real sense, the votes are the pay for. The votes are where the money comes from. So once the bill is is drafted and once the votes are there and the legislation is passed, the spending happens as the central bank, the government's fiscal agent, carries out the payments that have been authorized by Congress on behalf of the US Treasury. Now, how do they carry out payments? Wait for this. Hey, I can't hold up my keyboard because I'm using my laptop, but if I could hold up my keyboard, I would hold up my keyboard because that's how the payments are carried out. The Federal Reserve uses nothing more than a computer keyboard to credit the appropriate bank accounts with digital dollars that are known as reserves. And then the recipient of those funds has their account credited by their bank. So this is all done electronically through crediting of bank accounts. And that's where the money comes from. So we've seen it, we saw it with the 2.2 trillion in March. They did it again in December of last year, a $900 billion package. And then just last month, Congress came in with one more COVID rescue package, 1.9 trillion. Again, a piece of legislation that sent just one set of instructions to the Federal Reserve, go change the numbers up in the appropriate bank accounts. If you got that $1,400 check, you got a credit to your account, the keyboard, uh, did the work and the digital dollars appeared in your account. If you're getting extra unemployment compensation, that's how that's happening. So what we're entering now is a different phase. And I think this is where I'm going to wrap up with this, Giannis, but this is where I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I don't think that we have, you know, broken the austerity mindset altogether because what Democrats are talking about now with this 
climate slash infrastructure package is you know, something that's been proposed by the White House, something on the order so far of 2.25 trillion, but this time they want to quote unquote pay for it. They don't want to pass this bill the way the last three bills that I just described were passed. They want to offset the spending, which means they want to send two sets of instructions to the central bank. One set of instructions that tells them to go out and credit the bank accounts of the workers who will do the work repairing America's crumbling infrastructure, putting up electric vehicle charging stations and doing care work and all the rest, those people will get credits to their accounts. The other set of instructions would tell the central bank to debit, mark down the numbers in the accounts of many corporations because Congress has decided that it wants to write a bill that says we're going to spend money, but we're also going to raise taxes. So two sets of instructions. And this is falling more into a kind of, I don't want to necessarily call it austerity, but when Biden went before the American people and talked about this, he said that his plan would raise more revenue than he is even proposing to spend. And he added that that would help reduce the deficit and debt long term. So when you hear stuff like that, that's definitely beginning to sound an awful lot like uh, an administration that's starting to worry about deficits and debt. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like Stephanie and I have had this debate a little bit where I, I just am like, I'm really in favor of raising taxes on corporations and the wealthy. and. I wor I, I under I get the and I think I think you are too. Like in theory, um, we want to do it not because we need it to pay for this, uh, but because we have absolutely untenable levels of inequality, um, and we need redistributive policies because inequality of the kind that we have is a moral hazard. It's 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 epically dangerous that we have a billionaire class with so much excess capital that they're able to not only buy off our political class, but build multiple escape routes, including literally their planet Bs, right? The, the, uh, the, uh, the slogan of the climate justice movement is there is no planet, planet B, but um, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk beg to differ um, because they're, they're building rocket ships to go there uh, to escape the mess they've made. And I think that that's, um, it is, it's a moral hazard for the wealthy to not have to live in the mess that they create. The, the rockets to Mars are an extreme expression of this, but I think we're seeing the retreat of the wealthy into sort of gated castles of various kinds um, in, in extreme forms throughout the pandemic, right? And I think the sort of stay at home orders have really accelerated that process where it's like, you know, the home has the classroom, the home has the boardroom, the home has everything that you need and anything that you don't have can be delivered by drone or through some no touch technology and so on. So I, I don't, I, I'm interested, Stephanie, that you, that you feel that, 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 the, that the tax increase is the tell that we are going to face austerity because my fear is that if we don't have the tax increase, that it increases our chances of a couple years down the road being told, oh, we, we, we've driven up the deficit so much that now we can't do anything more. And we know that even though two point, you said two five is a staggering sum, it's also not enough. Um, you know, if we want to have uh, climate action on this, uh, at the speed and scale, <clears throat> that we actually need to, 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 to prevent catastrophic warming, it's about a third of the size of the spending that we need. So I'm worried that if we don't increase taxes and increase revenue, that it accelerates the point at which we get told, sorry, coffers are empty, we can't do anything. Um, but but uh, tell me why I'm wrong, Stephanie, because... Uh, <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. I think that almost no one any longer believes the coffers are bare, the deficits of the past constrain the spending capacity of the future. We were told that with the Obama deficits, we need a Simpson Bowles commission, we have to have austerity, we're not gonna be able to survive, my God, the deficit, the deficit, so we got austerity. 
and we got the pivot to austerity, we got Trump. Trump comes in and he wants to do these huge tax cuts and people like Larry Summers, right? Who was treasury secretary under President Clinton. He was Obama's senior economic advisor, head of the National Economic Council. Larry goes ballistic. Larry hates the idea of the Republican tax cuts. He does one of his interventions. He goes all over the media. In November of 2017, Larry's all over the place. And he's saying, if the Republicans pass these tax cuts, these are his words, we will be living on a shoestring for decades to come because of the increase in the deficits. We will be living on a shoestring for decades to come. Republicans passed the tax cuts the following month. Deficits increase, CBO says by 1.9 trillion over 10 years. We have a huge increase in the deficit. What happens? Growth picks up a little bit, unemployment goes down a little bit, inequality widens, inflation stays low, coronavirus comes and we're spending trillions and trillions of dollars. So what I'm saying first is, I think everyone can now see that you know, the government doesn't have to keep its powder dry. We don't have to run small deficits or anything like that in order to be able to afford to do things in the future. Now, the bigger point for me, Naomi, is this, and I did a thread yesterday because I get really agitated about where I think this administration is going right now and the mistakes I see them making. So here's what we have. <sighs> the Biden administration says 2.25. That's what they come out with and they wanna pay for every penny of it mostly through increased taxes on corporations. They want to take the corporate income tax rate from 21% back up uh, up to 28%, right? Republicans dropped it from 35% to 21. Democrats want to go from 21 to 28. Well, Biden does. But already a number of Democrats are yeah. saying no. They're pushing back. They don't want to go to 28. They're buying into this. We'll lose competitiveness and all that sort of stuff. Maybe we'll go to 25. Now, as soon as you do that, you've given up some revenue. So then what do you do? Do you then scale down the ambition of your spending package because you've lost some revenue? So you say, well, we can only do a smaller package now. Do you start fighting over different taxes to increase? Do you really think, do you really think that in this Senate that we have today, that you have 50 Democrats who will vote for a slew of tax increases, I guarantee you there is no, there is not support for a wealth tax. Forget about it. It's, mm -hmm. it's impossible. What about all the rest of the things that you might imagine that Democrats could do? That you're going to have a hell of a fight. I'm, I'm seriously concerned that the votes aren't there. Yeah. If the votes are there, terrific. Go for no, it. They're not there. Joe Manchin's not going to vote for a tax increase. Well, yeah. There. So, so here's the thing that I said in this thread. I said, if the votes are there, great. Go knock yourselves out, push taxes up, do your offsets and, and, you know, play, play the pay for game, go do it. But what if the votes aren't there? I want to know that there's a plan B. And so I suggested a plan B yesterday. The IRS commissioner testified yesterday before I think the Senate Finance Committee, uh, Senator Wyden's committee, the IRS commissioner comes in and he sits down and he says, you know, if we had enough funding to enforce the tax laws that are already on the books, we could get an extra $1 trillion a year that's 10 mm. trillion over 10 years, which by the way, is the same number that people like Ed Markey and AOC are saying we should be spending 10 trillion, not 2.25. Yeah. So Kelton comes on and does a big Twitter thread and says, hey, has anybody noticed that there's 10 trillion in low hanging fruit here? Mm. You don't even have to vote to raise a single tax. Give the IRS the resources they need. Let them go out and generate you 10 trillion and go for the much yeah. bigger package. So that's where I am. Yeah, I, that sounds great to me. And I, I definitely think strategically, the push needs to be to just spend and don't hold it back. Just yeah. spend, improve people's material lives and get a bigger majority. Um, yeah. Because this is just too close. It gives way too much power to certain people. Um, and, 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 and they will fight that too because of what Yana said earlier about what austerity is really about. It's about disciplining. Uh, a workforce. And, you know, as you were talking, Yanis, about Mr. Peel, I was remembering this quote um, from a DuPont executive uh, in 1933 opposing FDR's New Deal. And I think it was 33, maybe it was 34, um, where he was complaining that uh, he had lost five servants 
because the government was paying uh, such good wages for people to uh, to build things and paint things. Um, and he wasn't able to hold on to his household staff. It was just a disaster for him, right? Um, and I think if we think about that as a microcosm for what um, Silicon Valley is really going to be worried about, and, and think about the, the recent union drive at an Amazon ware warehouse that failed, but it failed in a context where there was no competition. If you listen to workers in Bessemer um, who voted against the union, it's mm -hmm. like, look, this is a, an abusive job. It, it's punishing on the body, but it pays $15 an hour and it has some benefits and they're the only ones offering it, right? Um, so, you know, we need to be thinking about front loading um, the, the direct creation of, of well-paying job be, in part because that empowers workers to demand more, right? Because they're going to be the force that are going to be demanding. And, and related to this is the push for um, better protections for, for unionization under the PRO Act, which um, I think is another really key piece of this. So how do, how do we change the dynamics so that we can win that full 10, 10 trillion to actually um, deal with the climate crisis? Yeah, you know, just earlier today, I read that um, on this very day, a number of Republicans in the Senate are introducing a bill to establish one of these fiscal responsibility commissions like a Simpson Bowles 2.0. And they want this, this, they want to assemble a bipartisan commission and charge them with the mandate of working together on a plan to balance the budget. So if you're, when you say they're going to fight back and make sure that, that money is not spent on poor people, on improving the lives materially of people and yeah. dealing with climate. This is all part of the way that they're laying, attempting to lay the foundation for that. Now, I hope that they won't find a single Democrat to sign on, you know, to that uh, legislation. But, you know, you've got a number of these people who for many years have flexed their, you know, uh, fiscal hawkery bona fides and and viewed themselves as you know hawkish on uh, the budget and so forth. So I get worried about you know a number of of Democratic senators who might align with these Republicans around the establishment of a commission like this, which would just undermine completely the progressive agenda. And and I think we need to. Um be really clear that whether we're talking about the US or we're talking about the UK or or certainly in I'm in Canada right now um, you know s s austerity a lot of it plays out not at the federal level right i mean it's mm -hmm. about cities it's about it's about provinces and states and you know this is what's determining education budgets which and we're already starting to hear the first cries of look you know we lost our tax base we can't afford public transit we can't afford to, to pay for education. I, and Brian, I really want to come back to your question around what about growth? Because I think we haven't tackled that. And I think that that is the elephant in the room. And it's actually weirdly possible that we could spend trillions of dollars building out green infrastructure and increase carbon emissions. Because um, if we aren't dealing with consumption, um, it, 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 it's possible to have a, a green carbon boom, uh, as, as contradictory as that is. So what we need to be doing is investing in low carbon sectors. We need to be, um, we need to be looking at what actually improves quality of life um, and investing in, uh, you know, access to nature, um, recreation, um, giving people shorter work weeks, um, really investing in well-being and the care economy and moving away from, from endless consumption, fighting for the right to repair um, and, 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 and dealing with the, the mentality that we can just shift from fossil fuel extraction to green energy and live exactly how we're living. As Arundhati Roy says, you know, middle class environmentalists ask the question, how do we change without changing? Um, and the answer is, we don't. We actually have to change how we live, um, and so um, so I think that that's that that's a really really key question. Um, and yeah, I, I I also think the re whether we're dealing with a revenge of the real is another important question because I think in some ways we are, and in another way we're dealing with a retreat into screens. 
Um, and this brings up my other austerity fear, which is what the agenda is of Silicon Valley and all this. Um, because what I worry about is cities going broke and, um, and then smart cities coming in as the fix. And I'll give an example from Toronto where uh, Google tried to, um, uh, they, they tried to use Toronto as this laboratory for the smart city idea. So they tried to um, do this thing called, they, they, Google has this division called Sidewalk Labs and they were gonna do Sidewalk Toronto. Basically their pitch was to the Toronto City Council, you can't fix the potholes, you can't invest in green energy, you can't invest in, 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 in um, public transit, we'll do it all, we'll build a beautiful emerald green city, but we're also gonna put you all under the most intense surveillance and data extraction you know, that we see anywhere outside of China. Um, and thankfully Toronto fought back and in the middle of the pandemic, and it was just a little you know, footnote to all the drama, um, Google pulled out of the Sidewalk Labs, canceled their Toronto contract. But the CEO of Sidewalk Labs, when they pulled out, said, we don't think we got off on the right foot with Toronto, but we see all kinds of post-pandemic opportunities. And what I read between the lines there is cities around the world are going to be dead broke and we're going to come in and save the day. And we just have to have this on our radar in how we think about what us, what the next phase of austerity looks like. It's trading our privacy for um, you know this kind of tech enclosure and privatization through the back door. Now, one thing I would add on um, on the growth issue is this: you know, for so many years, the obsession was with Debt, so-called debt sustainability and with debt to GDP ratios, right? This idea that there was some, for a while we were told tipping points that if countries allow their debt relative to their GDP to reach 90%, this is a threshold of some kind to tip over the 90% uh, level. And then a lot of bad things happen, the risk of fiscal crises and slower growth and all this stuff, right? So the countries that saw their debt maybe approaching that so-called tipping point, then become obsessed with trying to wrestle the debt ratio down. And Giannis talked in the opening about, you know, the, how counterproductive austerity is. So you start focusing on the numerator, the debt. How do we bring the debt down? Austerity. So you start cutting spending, but one person's spending is another person's income. And so you undermine the ability of that person to spend in an economy that runs on sales, right? Capitalism, runs on sales, which generate revenue, which generates the profit that makes capitalism viable. So you, you adopt austerity to try to target the numerator, the debt, as in an attempt to reduce the numerator, to bring the whole ratio down. But what happens is you crush the economy, so GDP falls, so the ratio actually gets bigger, so austerity doesn't work. But the other piece is that we become obsessed with the idea of growing our way out of debt. So if you focus on the denominator instead of the numerator, then the strategy, the economic strategy can become, we just need to grow really fast. And if we can grow fast enough, we can outrun our debt problem. And so I think in a lot of ways for many countries, the, the obsession with growth is very much bound up with this obsession that countries have about the idea that the debt is unsustainable, that it represents a burden on the future and that you've got to get the, you know, get the ratio down in order to Ooh. have, you know, a fiscally sustainable um, sort of situation. And, and I think that that then feeds this, um, this growth obsession, which Naomi's talking about, we have to get away from. 